going to open it up for questions, comments, and reflections. And who would like to go first? Okay, let's start on this side of the room. Yes. Um, why don't we go first in the middle of the room? Is this Hannah from Bifford who said she'd give a few reflections and then we'll move through? Thank you very much and, um, and congratulations to uh, Romilly and uh, the rest of the team for this report. Um, it's very good timing given that this is a really big week in development, um, I guess in order of, important, uh, of, in order of timing rather than importance. We've had um, a meeting of the global partnerships, uh, the global partnership for effective development corporations, uh, first, second meeting of its steering committee. Uh, there's been the discussions around post-2015 framework, which is focusing on global partnerships, so very relevant uh, for this work, and also the BRICS Summit, um, which, as, as Matthew was saying, is looking at a development bank, and also has a very strong focus on development cooperation, um, which is very important for us. And there's lots linking all of these. Um, they are very future-focused, they're very focused at the international level as well. But what's really useful about your work is this country focus. And I think um, from a different perspective, it's very good to hear about that country focus and um, would certainly encourage more case studies if you can. Um, I would second Matthew's point as well about the fact that these um, flows are not necessarily so new. But what's useful is that we are actually understanding them better and um, getting more information about them. And in that sense, competition <coughs> is a good thing um, from our perspective, but we want to know more about the competition. Um, so again, another reason why your report is so helpful, but also why the Global Partnership is also uh, very helpful and other forums like the UN Development Corporation Forum, which help us really understand each other a bit more. And not just bringing in these, uh, the emerging economies, but also bringing in private sector, other actors like civil society organisations, philanthropists and so on. And I think from a ministerial point of view um, at the Global Partnership, that was something which was very strongly endorsed uh, over the weekend. I had a couple of questions for you um, which relate to some of the activities that the Global Partnership uh, will be taking forward. And um, one, of that, one of those is about this aspect of co-learning and uh, the, the points that you made around ownership, uh, alignment and speed being... Uh, the major benefits that, uh, that countries might perceive from the non-traditional providers. And I wondered whether you had any thoughts on how that, those lessons can be incorporated in the uh, reporting, I guess, the reporting at the end of the year um, for the Global Partnership. Um, there is a monitoring framework that is there at the moment, and Ronald was very strongly involved in um, in its uh, inception. But how do we make sure those lessons also come in? Come in uh, because those tend to, that framework also tends to be based, has been based quite a bit on the Paris and Accra, and it's important not to lose that, but how do we also bring in these new lessons? <coughs> the second question I had was, um, you didn't really talk much about results and untying. Mm -hmm. And I wondered, whether you had any uh, lessons that you may have had at the country level on those two. Thanks again. Great, thank you. I'm going to pass along this row, actually, because there's a few there, and then I'll come back. Thank you. Um, Alistair Fraser from Cambridge University. Um, what an excellent piece of work. I've just had a skim of it uh, now. It's not possible to have sort of <laughs> detailed uh, reflection on it, but um, it's gratifying to see somebody using some of our work. So. Um, <laughs> <That's> uh, <really laughs> That's that's very interesting. I mean, the the um, work we were doing in two thousand and eight was obviously uh, we had a sense that it was a bit pre uh, crisis boom, China, all sorts of things that we're, we were very aware we're going to change all the negotiation context. And so it's really interesting to see someone sort of taking it on and, and seeing what happens um, more recently. Uh, one thing I was slightly surprised by was the suggestion that ideology doesn't matter. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that. I was partly interested from a, a Zambia perspective um, because you're obviously researching in a moment after a change of government to a government that some people see as having uh, some sort of changed agenda. And I wonder about, and a lot of the politicians have been coming out 
and making speeches about moving beyond aid dependency and blah, blah, blah. Uh, and to what extent that uh, there's just a gap between what moderately nationalist politicians like to say and what they tell their Minister of Finance to do, which is get the money in, get the money in, get the money in. Um, and, and whether you were able to talk to politicians or whether this was mainly the kind of the aid management structure, which is obviously mainly tasked with um, getting the money in. Um, so it's, it would be somewhat unsurprising if they were to say, we're not trying to move past aid dependency, my job is to get as much money as I can this year. Um, only one other thought, uh, which is that the diagram that you reproduce, uh, the text goes on to criticise it and say this isn't actually how it works. This is a, a model of how you might think it works, but of course it doesn't because donors are so heavily integrated into the state, the negotiation <coughs> happens over and over again. And I wonder if you either reject that argument um, and think, no, we can think of this as a two sovereigns battling it out, um, or whether perhaps things have changed, right? That uh, debt relief, um, new donors, etc., makes it look again more like that diagram, which in, in a sense we put up as a model of, mm. of how you might think about it, but it's wrong mm. um, because we were thinking about heavy donor integration into the state machinery. Mm. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much. Yes, we'll turn from the OECD. Yes, hello. I'm Suzanne from the OECD. Um, first, it's a very timely and uh, very good uh, yeah, uh, report you've produced and uh, we hope we can contribute <laughs> to <laughs> the next phase in going forward. Um, I think, well, the focus you have on the arena for negotiation and, uh, and also looking at uh, development finance from partner country instead of the source, what we tend to do a lot uh, at the OECD, is very, very, very uh, helpful. Um, so we are not for looking at who's paying, but actually, yeah, how money is arriving. Um, I think in terms of um, going forward, I think it would be helpful to perhaps look a little bit at the, the taxonomy you have, because the non-traditional donors, we. Uh, yeah, having looked carefully and discussed uh, with colleagues and so on, we see we have a sense that we are inflating a little bit. So, for example, Korea, for us, is a traditional donor, um, and they are in this uh, mouvance of wanting to be really a DAC donor, really, and obey all those uh, to all those uh, characteristics that DAC donors. Uh, and also with respect to the global funds, even if uh, some of them are, are fairly recent, um, <coughs> they are mostly funded by <laughs> traditional donors. So they are uh, yeah, subscribing to Paris Declaration principles and so on. So that's uh, a little bit um, areas where there would be yeah, room for fine tuning, I think, mm -hmm. in a phase two. Um, so perhaps it would be actually more granularity of the taxonomy that could be a good idea. Um, then, in terms of um, how uh, DAC donors, uh, yeah, how, what are the trends and what are the likely trends in going forward? Um, we've just completed the f forward spending survey where we survey donors and uh, non-DAC donors and multilateral agencies in what their future programs are, on and only looking at country program of aid, to, which is <laughs> good aid, <laughs> if you can say. And here we are actually seeing a shift towards uh, middle income in going forward. So DAC members are not leaving uh, the middle income countries. So they are stepping up their efforts there. Probably the instruments they're using there is more t take more the form of uh, lending instruments rather than pure grant. So I think you could say that traditional donors are looking, uh, are moving into new grounds and adopting non-traditional approaches. So there's also some uh, some elements mm -hmm. there you can, and also we are slowly seeing them also going more into infrastructure, if you look at uh, uh, mega trends over time. So uh, that's a couple of mm. comments mm. I would Thank like you, to that's offer. Really helpful. Thank you. And can we bring over here? And as, as the microphone moves, I've got a question online here from Lee Bailey, who's at LSE, just up the road, down the road. Um, what's the correlation between shifts in aid, both so-called <coughs> traditional and non-traditional, 
and the securitization of aid agenda. Have supply-side security needs on DAC donors affected how developing countries choose or receive aid? So is, th is the broader agenda around securitization somehow influencing uh, how partner countries view um, uh, traditional uh, development assistance? Hello, um, I'm Anna Thomas. I've worked for a number of NGOs on aid policy issues for some years. Um, I was really interested in the finding on coordination or the lack of priority countries gave to it. So if that's not a priority now, it certainly did appear to be five or ten years ago. And do you have any more sort of insight into why that might be? Is it that attempts to deal with it haven't worked? Is it that it's they have worked and countries, these particular countries anyway, feel that it's no longer a problem because they know how to manage it? Or what? Mm. Okay, great. I'm going to now allow for a few reflections back from, the, from, from our speakers and discussants. Um, and there are a whole number of things in there, so don't feel you cover, have to cover the waterfront. Um, but maybe I'm going to actually, Ronald, are you are you still with us? Yeah, I'm still on the line. Great. I mean, there was a particular question um, here about about kind of ideology, and mm -hmm. and that might w want a, uh, a response from panelists here in London. But I want to give you a bit of a chance on this one, uh, Ronald. I mean, the the suggestion that somehow some of these non-traditional or newer or non dac DAC flows um, are somehow, um, you know, sort of free of ideology, or at least that is not uh, a, a problem for recipient countries. What, what's your view on that? Uh, uh, I think my view would be if we were looking at uh, the development cooperation in a very focused stance of facilitating or creating a neighboring environment for uh, low-income countries or partner countries to develop their own situation, then that would probably not uh, uh, influence their ideologies or will not bring the question of the ideological meaning uh, being the primary focus, what we need to focus on while delivering cooperation. But when it comes to the, uh, the, the, the primary element that we need to address, then the whole uh, world cooperation uh, 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 discussion relations becomes different. What am I saying exactly? I'm saying that for us as, 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 as list uh, uh, income countries, we are looking at whoever can provide uh, uh, financing on the terms that is aggregate to us, so that we can, we can develop our infrastructure, we can develop our sector, and our capacity to now look at what kind of uh, uh, ideology that we need to espouse. But if we begin at this uh, very stage of looking at the ideological leaning of the West, then we lose the entire picture of how and what kind of resources do we need in the first place to do what. So if we address the question of what we need to do, how to ownership, buying what we want to do, then we attract the resources, no matter where these resources are coming from, then we define which course of direction we need to take. And that will be helpful. Then starting on the question of addressing, do you agree with this ideology or not? I think that's where the question uh, in my own view. Okay, thank you very much indeed. I'm going to pass now to Romilly. Do you want to tackle a few of those? <coughs> yeah, great. Um, thanks very much. Um, Hannah, your questions about co-learning and the implication for kind of uh, Paris. I mean, I think you know ownership and alignment are, are clearly in the, the Paris Declaration, and I think this this finding sort of gives more impetus to those areas. I do think with alignment, there's an interesting question about, you know, uh, which I think Matthew and, and Alison have both referred to, you know, do the DAC donors try to sort of pile in and say, okay, we're going to do the productive sectors too? Or do you need to look at alignment in the context of, well, actually, maybe the DACs are better off keeping with the social sectors and letting the non-DACs focus on the productive sectors? And I think Matthew's point that the DACs may just simply not be able to compete um, in the infrastructure sectors and probably have quite a comparative advantage in the social sectors, I think that's a really important one. And I think that that relates to the point that you made about wanting to know more about this competition. And we actually need to just understand this landscape a lot better. We need to have more information about who's doing what um, and what the different comparative advantages are. So I don't think it's, you know, you, you can't have a simplistic approach saying, right, everybody needs to go into productive sectors. But 
alignment needs to be sort of understood in the round about um, how the different actors can, can work together to support um, alignment. I think with ownership, I do think this has been something that we have talked about in the aid business for years and years and years, and I think has been very, very hard uh, for donors particularly to sort of give up control. Um, and so I think that actually the, the new competition is one way that they may be forced to do that. So I think it could be actually a good opportunity to give impetus to something that's been in the Paris agenda for a long time and, and hasn't made as much progress as it perhaps should. Um, I suspect with speed, one probably could find a fairly simple indicator that you could put into Paris and uh, post Poussin <coughs> type monitoring processes about time taken to disperse funds or time between initial discussion around a project proposal to finally, you know, that all not to be too complicated. And that was, you know, it, it came out, it, it was such an important issue. I think it would be really worth, worth doing. Um, Fraser, um, oh, Alistair Fraser, I think... Um, the the point about negotiation, I suspect it probably is getting more towards a negotiation now, and I think that was one of the things that came out, certainly in, in Ethiopia and Cambodia, that they did feel that they had a little bit more opportunity to, to bolster their negotiation power because of the, 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 the existence of the non-traditional donors. So I suspect that that shift is, is happening. It'd be interesting to see how, how it happens um, in the future. I, I do, I think ideology does matter, it's just we found that it didn't matter quite as much as, as the political and the economic context and I think, <coughs> yes, there is sometimes a disjuncture between what ministers are saying and what officials are saying and certainly in Cambodia you've got, you know, Hun Sen who's sort of going around uh, being very critical of donors very publicly and not afraid to say boo to a ghost at all and actually if you talk to the aid management people there, exactly as you say, they, they want the money coming in. So I think there is that that's disjunction. We've tried to capture that a bit in, in the research. Um, Suzanne on, yes, are we overinflating? I think Korea, you know, we argued a lot about Korea. We didn't argue, we debated a lot. <laughs> and I, suspect, I don't know, maybe we came out with the wrong <laughs> conclusion in the end. I'm not going to die in a ditch about whether Korea should be in one category or, or not. I think that the reason that we... Um, put it in the non-traditional category is that when you look at a lot of the literature, it tends to focus as, as Korea as a non-traditional provider, having some similar elements to some of the other non-traditionals. Um, but I think given that it is now a DAC member, perhaps if we were to do this again, we'd, uh, we'd, we'd, we'd put it in a different line. I do think with the global funds that there's perhaps, you know, mm -hmm. there are more innovative ways of, of spending money. They don't necessarily follow the, the same model as, 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 the, uh, as the more traditional providers. Um, but I agree on you know a more granularity that you could cut the cake in different ways. Um, I don't have a view really on the security mm. question. Mm. I think that's a hard one. Um, and Anna, just um, on the lack of coordinate priority to coordination, I think it is to some extent about this divide and rule point. I think that countries actually don't want everybody all. Well, some countries, as Matthew mm. said, it varies by country, but I think some countries will feel a bit like, you know, there's 20 people on that side of the table, one government here, and actually that's not necessarily working for them. Great, Sorry, thank I'm you. That's good. Alan, did you just have some additional... Uh, yes, just a couple of points around uh, priorities uh, for the type of aid uh, these countries wanted to receive, and in particular on results and a tying aid. Actually, never emerged in many of the interviews, only when prompted, uh, there was a mention around value for money and results, but never any kind of mention around untying, and probably this needs further unpacking in the next case mm -hmm. studies, understanding whether it's kind of limited to these three case studies, or if it's just uh, be because of a relative importance for uh, from a partner country perspective. Also to react uh, on our discussions, I'm happy that at least this kind of disconnection between the global estimates, we're seeing 30% in 2009 uh, at global level, doesn't reflect uh, at country level. And on a point on climate finance, we have colleagues actually on the same floor mm. with the climate finance updates, they are extensively mapping these flows, but still we wanted to kind of map disbursement and not commitments. And probably these climate finance flows will kind of emerge uh, probably in the next interaction uh, um, of the analysis. Okay, great. Um, I've actually got a question here which I'm going to throw in before I ask Matthew, uh, Matthew to come in, which is from uh, actually from Catherine Dong, who's with Macoro, uh, but is also a member of our Budget Strengthening Initiative um, work here in, in, uh, in ODI. She asked, what are the key reasons for the more strategic approaches to traditional and non-traditional assistance providers in Ethiopia and Cambodia as to compared to Zambia? What for a start, those are two very different countries mm -hmm. and with very different histories mm -hmm. in relation to mm -hmm. And 
then why is Zambia doing it uh, mm -hmm. or failing to do it in the mm -hmm. same way? So a little bit more on mm -hmm. that. We'll come back to you on that particular one. And a question for you. So this is good timing, Matthew, from uh, Afan Chimo, who's head of program funding at Care International. Um, the non-DAC donors in the study relate to focus relate to focused upon countries. I'm not quite sure what that means. But as opposed to the BRIC countries, what role do you see from the Middle East and Turkey kind of donors and findings of the study? Presented. Sorry, not a very articulate uh, question, but mm -hmm. I think basically, are there other players in here that we haven't really alluded to? Okay, I'll, com I'll come back to that. I wanted to, to answer a couple of the earlier questions. I mean, I think we, I sort of get to exactly the same point where we got to in the Cape Conference, which mm -hmm. is we shouldn't go too far in contrasting these two groups of donors. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a lot of ways in which they're quite alike. I mean, Korea is sort of exactly a perfect example. Mm -hmm. They are a member of the traditional donor club now, but they act like a non-traditional because most of what they do is infrastructure financing, and they're also coming out very well on cost effectiveness and speed and so on. So, I mean, it's fascinating to look at that. But you could also say, for example, we shouldn't go too far in saying one lot is growth and the other lot is social mm -hmm. sectors. Mm -hmm. The cheapest generic drugs that you can get in the world are coming from BRICS countries, and countries are lapping those up in health programs across the world, malaria nets as well. Um, <coughs> Gates Foundation is buying most of its stuff <laughs> from those providers. Mm -hmm. um, similarly, a lot of the DAC donors are not careering towards growth now. They have been doing growth for quite a long time. Yeah. And you know you see that a lot with DFID in yeah. terms of private sector and, and the, the in, in, in emphasis on that. But it's also true um, that a lot of donors are moving much more in that direction now. I think for me, the key thing would be we must not lose the major comparative advantage that DAC donors have. And what has that been? Really, it's been budget support, mm -hmm. above all. Mm -hmm. And if DAC donors are now all going to abandon budget support, I think Southern recipients will mm -hmm. be saying very seriously, what really is the comparative advantage of these donors? Because it's not clear that they can deliver on projects cheaper, faster, more cost effectively than some of these non-traditional people. So we really do need to warn some of our politicians. And you did see this. Uh, Ronald has been not talking about <laughs> suspension of budget support in Rwanda. But I was looking at the Rwandan <laughs> press a couple of weeks ago. There was some very negative reaction to that, saying, do we really need these people anymore with you know Chinese and other people around mm. and so on? Obviously, they do. But they, I think the more you see that, and if you, if you ask my, my take on Ethiopia, and Cambodia and why they're doing more of this is it is slightly ideological. I mean, those mm -hmm. are left of center governments which mm -hmm. care more about socialist solidarity and south-south mm -hmm. cooperation. Of course, when you get beyond the speeches to the practicalities, people like Ronald are sitting there going, do we want this money? Is it really worthwhile? Is it good? Is it bad? Not, we want the money because it's about south-south solidarity. But that, that is, an, I think, an important mm -hmm. factor. Um, one other thing about aid dependence, I think really um, it's not to say that, I think it's interesting it didn't come out strongly in the studies because a lot of countries are really increasing their budget revenue, are really growing fast and are therefore decreasing their aid dependence as we, as we showed in a report for Action Aid last year. Um, and I think that's another means or another reason why we all need to be aware that the the recipient countries have more negotiating power because they can say we're funding a bigger proportion of this ourselves now and therefore we can afford to be slightly more strategic. And finally, just on indicators, uh, there is a, a meeting going on on April the 15th in India um, of all the different BRICS research institutes talking about how, with their government officials, talking about how would you build on some of the work the DCF has been doing uh, on South-South cooperation and think about indicators that could go into the global partnership framework for South-South cooperation. And I really agree, if I had to say one, it would be what Romilly said, which is mm -hmm. about speed, because mm -hmm. I think that would give a really big kick up the backside mm -hmm. to some of the organizations which want to deliver infrastructure and maybe take five or seven years to build a road. Mm. Great, mm. okay. Um, I'm gonna go out again now, so if you have got a question or comment. Um, first, I'm <coughs> gonna go to Andrew, who's one of the authors. Um, Thanks very much. Um, um, a very, very rich conversation. Um, I wanted to dwell a little bit on this question of speed and also the chances um, that um, uh, traditional donors <laughs> or DAC donors are going to try to emulate and, and what, what, with what uh, degree of success, potential success, the behavior of the uh, big infrastructure funders, uh, in particular China and India. Um, when we were in Ethiopia, it was sort of quite clear that um, actually, a very large part of the aversion to conditionality of a government, partly it's ideological and not wishing anybody to step on their policy toes, even if their policy was a little bit her heterodox, 
But partly it's simply that we're very candid. It was speed. If we sign up with a World Bank who's giving us money cheaper, and you know, and then we're hung up for a couple of years debating some some uh, reasonable in their minds conditionality, then we we've lost a lot of time and we can't afford that. So that was an interesting thing. The other is that even in relatively, <coughs> let's face it, de uh, um, economic management situations. Um, this is extraordinarily decentralized, and what there is, and I, I'm going with uh, Matthew on his idea <coughs> that it's going to be very hard to beat the Chinese contractors, etc., at their own game, um, is actually deals are brought to um, the Chinese <coughs> authorities already fairly, high, fairly well advanced uh, between contractors or potential contractors um, and, um, and the uh, utilities operating. Um, and then there is a quite reasonable uh, degree of control from the Ministry of Finance that this doesn't uh, break the bank, but that's already at LIBOR plus three percent, or, or you know things of that kind. Try to imagine what would be wrong. I mean, how how difficult it would be for our export credit uh, organisations <coughs> and our contractors in DAC countries, I say, our um, to actually try to compete on this on this terrain. They just don't have, these sort of membranes are much more permeable. I mean, there's a lot of things that could be said about this, but it's a completely different world. And it's not surprising to me that they do win on objective basis, World Bank and other contracts. Great, thank you. <coughs> Let's go to that side of the Sorry. room now, because I've been in the middle all the way. So there's two, two um, questions from the middle. Yep. Um, hi, it's Laura Jump from Development <coughs> Initiatives. Um, I wanted to start by thanking all three authors for what is a fantastic report and links in very well with some of the work we're doing on investments to end poverty, which is looking at the global side of what resources are available. Um, and we're very much working closely with you guys and looking forward to carrying on to these further phases. Um, <coughs> but I'm just interested, um, one thing that we haven't been able to discover and in, in your recommendations for the aid effectiveness sector, on the third recommendation you say that we should be encouraging better um, quality of data and capturing of data. <coughs> and one thing that I'd be really interested to hear from any of you is whether you have, what kind of demand you saw at the recipient country levels for improved data and improved information, um, both capturing collection and then accessibility um, for them. Thank you. You can pass the mic behind you, thanks. Hi, my name is Catherine Garson and I am um, an editor and I've done a lot of work on the South African budget documentation. I wanted to ask in your research in the three countries whether the issue of corruption came up at all, um, particularly in relation <coughs> to whether the aid from non-DAC countries, whether reporting structures are much looser and there's much more space for um, opacity. <coughs> okay, thank you very much. And was there another one over there? I thought there was. Oh, Gideon, you <laughs> you're all the other the other side. Yeah, I'm going to zoom all the way over to Gideon, and then I'll come back. Gideon Rabinovitz from uh, <coughs> ODI's Centre for Aid and Public Expenditure. Um, very quick question. I mean, obviously, obviously, a lot of you be, f be familiar with the fact that there tends to be um, a little bit of idealism seen in the way that DAC donors approach governance and conditionality. That they're really looking for very um, important developments in in democratic. Um, progress before they give their aid. So obviously quite often that gets idealised. It doesn't, in practice, it's not always like that. And then often on the other side, we're especially critical, maybe unfairly critical, about how some of the southern actors ignore governance and, you know, really are happy to just deal with whoever they, whoever they want. Um, as a test of this, I wonder if you could disaggregate at all for us what civil society you talk to in those countries feel about these various actors and some of the co ca co comparing and contrasting the way that they're actually in practice promoting ownership. Did you find any important insights from hearing from civil society? Okay, good. I think we need to quickly go back to that because I've just realised the time. So, Rob Romilly, do you want to, to take a couple of those? Would you, would you like to start to and kick off? And oh, okay. <coughs> Um, the point about demand from data from, from countries, yes, uh, I mean, Annaliso did the Ethiopia and Zambia study, may also want to comment on that, mm. but certainly in Cambodia, they've actually got a fantastic uh, database which has a lot of information about non-DACs. 
uh, in it, which is great and, 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 and a real step forward, uh, but it doesn't have a lot about philanthropic flows, you know, NGOs, it's been quite a political issue. Uh, so there certainly was from the, from the country level uh, in Cambodia, as I say, uh, uh, Annalisa can probably add. Um, civil society, <coughs> again, in the Cambodia study, I mean, it's a difficult one because um, a lot of the issues around which the, the traditional donors have, have imposed conditionality or, or uh, made quite a fuss are our issues around land evictions and human rights and so on, which obviously a lot of civil society organisations are uh, strongly supportive um, of them doing. Um, we didn't get a very strong picture of concern from the non-DATs for, for civil society, but I think it's, it, you know, it, it, it raises the issue around sort of ownership and, of course, in the Paris agenda, ownership is a good thing, but ownership if it can lead to uh, you know real uh, human rights violations and so on is is a bit of a challenging issue um C catherine corruption tended to come up more because uh, governments were getting fed up with people complaining about <laughs> the donors <laughs> complaining about corruption <laughs> which may may be very much related to the the, the sort of the, the sample of people we spoke to but again i think annalisa may want to, to comment on that in the zambia case okay go ahead so, uh, in terms of uh, data quality, I mean, the Cambodia case study has been uh, <coughs> quite, quite good in that less so was data variability in the case of Ethiopia and Zambia. But I have to say there was a sort of demand, especially from the Zambian government, to improve data collection not only when it comes to DAC donors. Uh, they have good data as well for non-DAC donors. Uh, and there are also non-DAC donors willing to share information and data. And there was probably the peculiarity of Zambia to this ex to, to on this variable. But in particular, in the case of Zambia, they're, they're really keen, at least my understanding, uh, um, to collect data also from philanthropic organizations, NGOs. There's a kind of general lack of information, uh, especially also in the case of Ethiopia, if you're thinking about, they have a really nice kind of structure of the different channels of development assistance, and they're not able to track for a series of reasons these flows that are going directly to NGOs. So there's a part that comes completely kind of unchecked uh, on that. So, but generally a kind of a strong demand also for policy purposes uh, to inform their decisions. On the strategic approach on uh, Catherine uh, uh, Dom question, uh, um, around the less strategic approach in the case of Zambia, I mean, we have to say that first of all, we're talking about the government, uh, Sata's government that uh, started in September 2011, so it's um, more recent than the other two, and there's a probably less clarity on the strategy uh, to be undertaken. We're talking about uh, a country that graduated that year uh, into middle income status uh, with more options to raise also additional development financing. Even when I was there in September uh, last year, they, uh, they issued a euro bond uh, that went uh, 25 times oversubscribed at 5%. So quite they have more options probably than the other countries, bearing in mind, um, I mean, of course, the kind of resource rich country and, and the kind of growth performance, recent growth performance, they have more options in terms of private flows that we haven't tracked in the project than um, Ethiopia and, and Cambodia probably. Mm -hmm. In terms of the kind of corru uh, corruption point, it was more on the corruption on the government side, uh, a few kind of reflections, even though it wasn't an issue that emerged forcefully uh, during our research, but not comparing the different types of uh, non-traditional providers. That there are no, not only non dark donors, the project kind of looked also into a broader kind of perspective. Great, thank you. Um, Ronald, um, there are sort of a number of references there to things that you <coughs> might want to, to comment on, but I was struck by Matthew Martin's comment about we should be careful not to fall into the trap of, you know, talking about non-traditional uh, flows as, as, as supporting sort of growth sectors and, and traditional flows sort of staying firmly within the social sectors. That clearly isn't how it looks on the ground. But, but, but how do you see this impacting the sort of composition of flows that are supporting growth? How does that look from, from Rwanda? Uh, as I, I think, yeah, drawing a clear line between the two would be a bit difficult. But in reality, what we are saying, at least when we call them um, traditional donors, particularly the sectors of infrastructure, energy, and uh, we normally see that reception that they are willing to engage in those sectors. And uh, we might want to agree that in the first government corporation, you know, the, the inflows were really more in sectors. So 
this something we can, we can from, from what's happening on the ground, we can confirm that the CEO of non-traditional owners more active, active in the infrastructure sector. Um, uh, probably less in, in the social sector. So there is that kind of um, uh, uh, division of labor, if I may say, which is not really formalized as such, but uh, practice. If you're okay, I wanted to comment a little bit on information and transparency. We are, we are finding a bit of a challenge when it comes to documenting what happened or the inflows actually uh, on an traditional uh, donor side. There is a, a gap trying really to uh, know all the information around this for uh, non-traditional donors. And when it comes to financial financing, when it comes to other private inflows, perhaps the capacity to uh, uh, document this is not yet there. As much as we have more uh, systems to capture the, the inflow of traditional donors. Now, briefly on the button, this comment on the, uh, on the predictability of financing. I think this is something, again, uh, tilting the balance, uh, changing the landscape, because if you look at uh, the nature of these um, firms, particularly uh, the traditional ones, there is an unpredictable level of change in political development, as the case was rather the recent. So uh, that also brings the whole question of um, uh, low income countries asking jobs. Uh, is the moment corporation the first place to help the poor, or it's uh, really about other? Interest, be it political or security. So uh, th this calls for looking at, uh, at the mix of instruments that we need to use. Of course, the budget support has been uh, uh, the top priority for us as a government. Uh, looking at what we've achieved under that framework, but the people now are starting to uh, can we probably look at different instruments that uh, we, we, we mitigate uh, the, uh, the, uh, the vulnerability of this? Uh, and finally, I think the issue of untying is really, in the report, yes, uh, it was referred to, but not really very clearly uh, and emphasized. We're still seeing this predominant on the side of the look at the China, India. Um, um, it is really strongly tied to their uh, 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 campaigns. And, uh, so many uh, what income countries will be arguing and discussing is how do these margin donors actually and time uh, going forward. Thank you very much, Ronald. We have we slightly lost you a little bit at the end there, but I think we've got the essence of that. Um, Matthew, we're kind of running out of time now. Could you just give us a few final thoughts? Sure. Um, just on the Middle East Turkey thing, which I didn't answer last <laughs> time, I think they fall much more into the what I, what I said about Korea, into the somewhere between the two. Um, Middle Eastern donors are reporting to the DAC. Turkey is a member of the OECD. I don't think of the DAC yet. Um, they have a lot of South-South characteristics and a few North-South <coughs> characteristics, so they're, they're, they're very interesting ones which we should be looking at more closely. Um, on the data, I think it's fascinating to hear, and it's certainly something we're, we're seeing in the UN and in our other work as well, that most of the data are now being collected, so it's a good example of coordination and cooperation at country level, so South-South donors are reporting to country databases, but there's a big problem at a global level, and uh, UN has done a lot of work to get better South-South data at a global level, but there's still a problem about really publishing it mm. on time in, in disaggregated ways, so I think that's where we need to put our efforts. On the, the human rights democracy stuff, and I think it's really important that what that was raised, because I don't know whether it's not being raised at country level, but it's certainly being raised by all the CSO coalitions at global level. Just before Busan, there was a big report by Better Aid that said, you know, South-South aid can be terrible because it ignores environmental social assessments, it violates human rights. Where I would come in on that is I think there are certainly examples where it does. There are also examples where North-South aid does. Mm -hmm. um, but if we really care about these things, democracy, human rights, and things like um, the, the corruption and so on, we need to probably be very careful about how we deal with this going forward. Because if what we're doing is getting countries to say, well, bye-bye DAC donors who care about these things, we'll switch to South-South and our own budget revenue, we could really lose out on those agendas moving forward. And I think that's one of the most important implications. So we need to have a really serious discussion dialogue with Southern providers about how they see those things, how they, there are certainly, you know, Brazil, South Africa care about these things in their own countries to certain degrees. Mm -hmm. So we should be able to work together on that. And finally, just a very quick thing on tying. 
I don't think anybody, I mean, people got obsessed about tying, and it's true that most, su most South, South Aid is tied. Mm. Um, but when you then see that Southern donors are, um, I shouldn't call them Southern donors because they hate <laughs> being called donors, <laughs> but anyway, Southern providers are actually winning multilateral competition, competitive bids these days. I think as we move forward, that's probably one area where we could think about them being more flexible. And they're now making much bigger contributions to multilateral orga organizations and global funds because of that, because they actually see that they can win these contracts. They don't need to be so paranoid about <laughs> being tied mm -hmm. because they can, they can yep. win anyway, because they're more mm -hmm. cost effective. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much indeed. I think this has been a terrific discussion. And I think it's a, uh, a real uh, testament actually to the quality of, of the work that's gone here for the team. So congratulations mm. on that. We put out a media release on this launch of this report today, which talks about a tipping point, um, a tipping point in relation to the balance, if you like, uh, of, we need, need to come up with a better <laughs> term, don't <laughs> we, but <laughs> traditional, non-traditional. I suspect we may be beyond that. Mm. This is a genie that is not going to go back in the bottle, and the question is now, can we keep up with the pace of change? This has huge implications, as Hannah indicated for, and Matthew for the Global Partnership for Effective Development, and what, that, what traction ultimately that's going to have on issues around effectiveness and quality, but it also presumably has huge implications for how we think about going forward, the reframing of MDG 8, which of course has been <coughs> one of the, uh, the biggest disappointments perhaps of the MDG framework to date. And in the post-2015 <coughs> context, what that is ultimately going to look like is going to be a very important part of the new framework. I want to thank very much Romilly and Annalisa, and of course Andrew for a fantastic report to our sponsors for the report, to Matthew for some brilliant comments there, to Ronald, thank you so much for hanging on on the line. I'm sorry our connection wasn't as yeah. perhaps great, but we really value your perspective uh, and it's added a huge amount to this discussion. And thank you to all of you. And it is my final goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> um, I thought I was doing this last week, but I've had the opportunity to come back. <laughs> It has been a fantastic four years that I've had an opportunity to lead ODI. This is a fantastic institution. You all turn up on a regular basis, and we're, we're hugely grateful for that, and I want you to continue to in the future because we continue to go from strength to strength. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.